for Creamy Media's Polity, I'm Lumgilen Gomve. Joining me today is Diane Hawker, here to discuss her book, How to Steal a Gold Mine. You've been involved with this story since 2010. Briefly give our viewers background into the story in which Aurora Empowerment Systems stepped in to rescue Pamotse Gold Mine and tell us what motivated you to start writing this book. Well, when I first started covering the story in 2010, I was working at the Sunday Independent and I spent quite a lot of time visiting the different mines that had been taken over by Aurora Empowerment Systems, the Port Flay Mine in Springs and the mine in Orkney. And each time that I went there, I, I interacted with the workers who were affected by um, this mine takeover. By 2010, it had already been several months um, since Aurora had taken over the mine. The workers hadn't received their December 2009 uh, Christmas salaries and subsequent salaries after that. They had gone on strike and they were very frustrated by what was going on. And then eventually we saw, you know, a number of legal processes unfold um, in which the Aurora directors were removed by the master of the high court. The master of the high court held an investigation into what actually happened with the Aurora deal. And ultimately, there were also several court cases that were conducted to have the Aurora directors declared delinquent directors, as well as to get some of the money returned that was paid out. So I followed all of those court cases as they unfolded. And it's a story that I kind of stuck with for several years. Um, and I was still in contact with some of the mine workers and they got in touch with me from time to time telling me that, you know, they still hadn't received um, payments that they were expecting. Only about 300 workers were actually paid. And it was just a story that I think I couldn't let go of because it really had gone on for so long and it had been part of my life for such a long time that it really stuck with me. I, I mean, I collected an obscene amount of documents. I have boxes and boxes um, of documents that are that are now in storage. Just over almost a decade of of covering the story so it just it made sense to put that all into a book to really explain to people what happened and tell us a bit about the involvement of former president jacob zuma his associates and some family members so uh, former President Jacob Zuma, his involvement is not something that you'll necessarily see directly in the Aurora deal. His nephew, Kulubuse Zuma, was one of the directors. And former President Nelson Mandela's grandson, Zondo Mandela, was also one of the directors. Um, President Zuma's lawyer, Michael Halley, was also listed as one of the directors, although he told the inquiry of the master of the high court that he wasn't actually really a director. He did get involved um, after the fact, but his involvement is a, is a little bit less clear than the, than the others. But what you do see is that definitely having that proximity to the former president did give the Aurora team a bit of an edge. One of the things that they mentioned in some of their court papers was that, you know, Zondra Mandela and Kulubuse Zuma were chosen because of their having the necessary political connections. And one can only take that to mean, uh, you know, their proximity to the president at the time. I think what's also important to note, of course, is that when all of this was unfolding, there were a lot of calls to government to step in. And we didn't see the Zuma administration really step into uh, to the extent that I think they could have. Yes, there was some work done by the Department of Labor, but, you know, he did definitely take I would say not a direct you know, role to be involved in, to actually resolve this matter, even though there were calls for his administration to step in. And of course, the SIU had been waiting for the former president Zuma to sign a proclamation. They confirmed on the record to me that they had done the work for a proclamation, um, but it, it wasn't signed at the time and their investigation didn't ultimately go ahead. In your book, you write about the personalities that led and managed Pamotsi and Aurora Empowerment Systems. In terms of their management styles, can you draw any distinctions between the two companies? Well, that's a difficult one. Um, I think Pamotsi had an idea of what it wanted to do with the mines. However, their financial position was not as firm um, in real terms as what they would have liked it to be. Um, according to Ndaba Nsele, when I spoke to him, he said that um, they had received funding and that funding was actually available for them to continue with the mine, but they were ultimately uh, placed under liquidation by, amongst others, the IDC and other creditors. So there was definitely a question about whether their funding position was 
was as firm. But the difference, I think, is that Pamodzi, as an organization, had a number of other functioning businesses. And to this day, we can see that Pamodzi, the group, is still something that is an ongoing entity. They have, you know, businesses in the food sector and various other sectors that are still ongoing. Um, and they also were a business that that had been around for several years before getting into the gold mining or trying to get into the gold mining sector. Aurora, on the other hand, was a relatively new business. In fact, the mine deal that they tried to do was really one of the first businesses that they actually, or business ventures, that they tried to undertake. Even though in their bid documents, they listed having other businesses on the go, the Redwood Timber deal, those were not deals that were actually actualized and they were not completed. So when you look at it, this was actually their first major transaction. And to have your first major transaction be the recapitalization and the rescue of several mines, I think that was perhaps not the best place to start, particularly because they didn't really have the funding that they came forward saying that they had. Uh, one of the things that one of the Aurora managers admitted in their testimonies that they didn't even have a bank account soon before undertaking this. So they were using somebody else's bank account. They didn't have money and they had to borrow money from members of the Indian community. That's the phrasing that they used um, to actually fund the purchase. So so for such a major transaction, um, I think their, their financial standing was not where it should have been to actually undertake this deal. Also, in your book, you detailed the embattled interactions between Aurora and Standard Bank. Why was it difficult for Aurora to prove that they had the funds to complete the purchase of these mines? Well, I think the thing to recall, and let me give some some context as well to, to the viewers, is that as part of Aurora's deal, they had offered around 650 million rand to purchase the Pamodzi mines in Orkney, as well as the Hrotfle mine in Springs. And this was one of the most lucrative and impressive bids that was put on the table. They had said that they would get 650 million from an, a Malaysian investment firm called AM Equity or AM Capital. The name interchanged in, in the documentation that was submitted. And this Malaysian firm was meant to be the funder. But when it came down to Standard Bank actually looking for this business in Malaysia, they couldn't actually find the business. The address that was given was in the same building as Standard Bank's Malaysian offices. So the South African team of Standard Bank, who were the transaction advisors to the liquidators, asked their, their Malaysian colleagues just to go and check because it was in the same building. And when they looked on that floor, it wasn't actually an office space. It was meeting rooms that were basically, you know, when if you have, I would say, a smaller type of business and you just want to use a meeting room to have meetings with people, but you maybe operate from your home or you operate from somewhere else. It was that kind of meeting room. And that raised a concern for Standard Bank because they were saying, you know, if you if this organization is going to come with 650 million, they would imagine that they have some kind of legitimate office space and that they would be traceable. The Malaysian Standard Bank team also hadn't heard of AM Equity, and that raised a concern to Standard Bank as to whether this was actually a legitimate funder. In your book, you also write about Raja Shah and how instrumental he was in spearheading the Aurora deal. But who exactly is Raja Shah? Well, that's 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 a very interesting one because Raja Shah is the is the Malaysian investor who I tried over several years to to track down um, initially while doing the story and also for the purposes of the book. He's the person that was put forward as the Malaysian investor who would come with the funding. He was seen by some people at the Fruit Fair Mine when the Aurora staff members were working on the premises. Um, so I've spoken to some people who said that they saw someone who identified himself as the Malaysian investor, who was Raja Shah. Where it becomes murky is that he left suddenly after the workers went on strike and has never been seen again. When I tried to track him down, um, I, I contacted some journalists in Malaysia who said that they hadn't heard of anyone by that name. And they actually said the name Raja Zainal Dato Shah is a very common name in Malaysia. So it would be difficult to identify a particular person unless they had any further information. I then found a Malaysian uh, investment company that had a director who was listed with, you know, a very similar background as to what was put into the Aurora 
a bid document. And when I phoned those officers, I, I couldn't get hold of him. Um, I was put through to another director who said that he was aware of the Aurora deal. He was aware that his former colleague had worked on it, um, but that the colleague was not available at the time. He gave me a cell phone number, which went unanswered. So, you know, it is murky. It seems like there is someone by that name um, who may have been involved in the investment space. But the question is whether that person is the person who came to South Africa, first of all, or whether there was a completely different person who was put forward as a front. Um, and unfortunately, after all these years, I haven't been able to get a definitive answer on that. But what is clear is that the money that was promised via AM Equity never materialized. And so the deal was never actually finalized. Um, so ultimately, Aurora didn't pay for the mines that it was on and that it did mining on and that assets were removed from. How do you assess the relationship of influential business people and liquidators? And are you hoping for change in the liquidation industry? I think that there is a need to definitely have change in the liquidation industry. Um, if you look at, at what happened with Aurora, for example, one of the liquidators in Vomitala who was quite a prominent liquidator. He was often the person who was doing interviews, who was the kind of the main liquidator. And it was later discovered that he should never have actually been on the liquidation role because he had a criminal conviction from the early 1980s um, that wasn't declared to the master of the high court. The legislation around liquidators says that you can't be a liquidator if you have a criminal conviction for anything that has to do with dishonesty. Um, and his conviction related to fraud. So he definitely should not have been anywhere near the liquidation process. And I think that's a major red flag for the master of the high court and for the Department of Justice to look at how did that happen? How did someone manage to get onto the liquidation role with a criminal conviction that went undetected for years? Because Enver Mutala was a liquidator for several years working on major liquidations in the country. Um, I think also, you know, his relationship with Aurora was questionable. Um, it was found out during the inquiry that there was a three million rand loan that he had made to Aurora, which he later admitted to having made in, in, in court papers where he was trying to get his job back as a liquidator. Um, and of course, you know, you can't be a liquidator and also have that kind of relationship with the people who are bidding for the company that you are you are managing the liquidation process of it's a definite conflict of interest and that was only found out you know subsequently as well so so i would i would hope that those who work in the master's office and the uh, department of justice you know look at, at at what happened with the aurora deal and try and find ways to improve the liquidation process to make it more well managed to improve the oversight that's there so that People know that, you know, if their business goes under liquidation, it's not going to have a situation like what we saw with Aurora. In your book, you addressed the job insecurity that mine workers, particularly in Hrotflay, were faced with as they were not being paid their salaries in full or at all. From your interactions with some of these mine workers, can you detail their lived experiences? Oh, no, absolutely. I think um, if you read the book, you'll find that the experiences of the workers are really central to the story. I didn't want to write a, a story that is just about numbers and famous names and politicians. The book is a legal book, but it's also a human interest story. And those workers, I spoke to them over several years and they let me into their lives to a certain extent, telling me about what happened in one of the worst periods of their lives. A lot of them were migrant workers, either internal migrants from the Eastern Cape or migrants from out of South Africa, Lesotho, Mozambique. And a lot of them felt uncomfortable going home until the process had been finalized, partly for, for the, the foreign workers because they had actually ended up overstaying their permits. And because they weren't employed by anyone, it would be difficult for them to just come back into the country. And they felt that if they left, they would basically leave the opportunity of ever getting any payment or even being re-employed somewhere else. So they they stayed on at the mine and they stayed, um, you know, in, in dilapidated quarters that were not really great living conditions. The, the ceiling boards had come out. There wasn't heating 
Um, there wasn't you know, running water, there was no electricity at the, at the time because a lot of it had been stripped out and, and um, presumably sold off. Um, so it really wasn't great living conditions that they were in, but they felt it would be better for them to remain on until they, they actually got some clarity. Some went to stay in the close by informal uh, settlements with a hope that they would ultimately get some sort of, of, of payment. Unfortunately, um, when there was actually some payments made in, in 2015, there were only about 300 workers who were paid and none of them were members of the National Union of Mine Workers. So that meant the majority of the workers were not paid. Um, you will recall there were about 5,000 workers overall in all the Pamodzi mines. Some did get um, other employment, but a large portion of them did not. So by the last time that I spoke to the Aurora liquidators, they said that they still had about 2,000 claims from workers that they were hoping could be resolved before the end of this year. The Hawks did start an investigation, but nothing came of it. Have the Aurora management team faced any consequences thus far? Look, there were consequences more within the civil aspect of the legal system. So when the liquidators were doing these various court cases, the main purpose was to prove the directors as delinquent directors. And having them proven as delinquent di directors would basically give the liquidators an opportunity to then claim money back directly from the, the directors. Um, unfortunately, the directors... Kulubuse, Zuma, Zondo Mandela, and Tulani Ngubane, um, they were not also all on the same sort of financial footing. So Tulani Ngubane and Zondo Mandela, um, when they were engaging with the liquidators, basically informed them that they didn't have any money available that could be paid back. Uh, Kulubuse, Zuma, he uh, agreed to pay 23 million back to the Aurora estate. And I will say that he has already paid a portion of that 23 million back, about 10 million, but the remaining amount hasn't been paid. So, so in terms of consequences, there's the aspect of them being declared delinquent directors, but it hasn't gone to the extent that I think the liquidators would have liked where they could have gotten you know, a significant amount of money back that they could have then used to either pay off debts, pay the, the workers um, and pay anyone else who was, who was owed money. Because of course, as much as the workers were owed, there were also other creditors like businesses, um, ESCOM, the revenue service, various other people who were also owed money by Aurora during that period. Finally, are you hoping your book helps in the plight of the workers who are fighting for their wages through the legal system? Yeah, I do. I do hope that that will be one of the outcomes of this book. I think, unfortunately, because of the South African news cycle being what it is and us dealing with so many issues of, you know, corruption and maladministration on a daily basis, we do sometimes tend to move on from stories and forget about things that have happened in the past. And I'm hoping that this story revives interest in what's going on with the workers and that hopefully someone can come forward to assist them. Um, unfortunately, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I'm a journalist who has just covered legal matters for a long time and, and I'm not able to get that involved in the process and assist them. But hopefully by someone reading this book, someone who has a legal background, they'll be able to come forward and help them in that claims process. As I said, there are still outstanding claims and the master of the high court has said that they want to wrap up this case before the end of this year. They actually want all the claims submitted by the end of April so that they can finalize the matter. So I'm hoping that someone can, you know, read it and really get energized by its content to, to assist them and, and see if they can also just help with those claims um, and really help them to get the funding or the money that they, that they had been hoping to get for over a decade. That was Diane Hawker discussing her book, How to Steal a Gold Mine.